Last week, we saw how Joshua led the Israelites into the Promised Land. They began well, but they didn't finish like they were supposed to. They were to conquer all the land. They conquered enough to feel comfortable, to feel safe. But because they didn't obey God completely and do what He said, and because they constantly turned away from, from Yahweh to other gods, Yahweh used those nations they didn't drive out to discipline the Israelites. He said, obey me completely and you will be blessed. If you don't, then you will be disciplined. And when they didn't respond to his discipline, they had to suffer the consequences. They had to be punished. The book of Judges is all about this cycle. Israel would disobey through idolatry, worshiping some god other than the one true god. They would be subdued by the enemy. After a while, they would cry out to Yahweh for deliverance. God would send a deliverer, a judge. They would live in peace for a while as long as they obeyed. And it seemed like they would obey as long as the judge lived. And then they would go back to sin again and start that process all over. This went on for 300 years. Obedience, rebellion, bondage, and deliverance. Same thing happens to us as individuals and as to churches today. We go through that same cycle. We will obey God, but then something happens and whether we do it consciously or not, we rebel, we just don't obey. And at some point, He will allow us to be in some kind of bondage so that we will see how far away we've gotten and then we will call back to Him and He will set us free from that. Now, it was during one of these times of bondage and oppression that the people cried out to Yahweh and He responded. In Judges chapter 6, verses 7 through 10, it says, When they cried out to Yahweh because of Midian, Yahweh sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, This is what... Yahweh, the God of Israel, says, I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am Yahweh, the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. But you've not listened to me. Why weren't these Israelites seeing God work? Because they didn't fulfill their part of the covenant. Obedience. God said it all. All you have to do is obey me. In order to get God's blessings, we must be obedient. Maybe that's something we need to pay a little more attention to in our own lives today. Now, Yahweh had told Joshua to be strong and courageous. Today, we're going to look at Gideon, one of those judges, whom God chose to deliver the Israelites. And we find that Gideon was the total opposite of Joshua. Verses 11 and 12 says, Then the angel of Yahweh came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. Gideon, son of jo Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide grain from the Midianites. The angel of Yahweh appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, Yahweh is with you. Because the Midianites were raiding the land, again taking all their food, Gideon was hiding at the bottom of a wine press, threshing grain, so he wouldn't be seen. And this angel appears, who Gideon realizes later is Yahweh, God, and he calls, God, or he calls Gideon a mighty warrior doesn't look much like a mighty warrior hiding in the wine press. But that's one thing about God when He looks at us. He looks at who you will be, not who you are right now. He looked at Gideon, not as he was hiding in that wine press, but at Gideon as to who he would become, the mighty warrior. God knows what you will become what you are going to be like. And that's how he sees you now. So this angel of God, angel of Yahweh, calls him mighty hero, and 
Gideon looks up and replies, Sir, if Yahweh is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say Yahweh brought us up out of Egypt? But now Yahweh has abandoned us, handed us over to the Midianites. Have you ever said that to yourself? Ever thought it? I know I have. God, why is this happening? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? I'm a Christian. I follow you the best I can. Where are you? How did God respond to Gideon when Gideon said these same things to him? So then Yahweh turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. See, God doesn't care about our excuses. He didn't try to defend himself to Gideon. He didn't remind Gideon that the people were not doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were living in disobedience. See, God knows the future. So he continues with his message to Gideon. And what does Gideon do? He begins making excuses. He says, but Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. And I am the least in my entire family. Remember Moses and the excuses he started using? Maybe you can think back to some excuses you've been using. Yahweh said to him, I will be with you. And you will de destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Gideon replied, if you're truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that it is really Yahweh speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering to you. See, the, the story of the fleece is not the first time Gideon asked for a sign from God. This is the first one. Maybe there's a little bit of doubt in, in Gideon's mind to what he was being told. Maybe he just wasn't sure. He didn't have enough confidence in himself. Whatever it was, he now tests this angel to see if it was really God speaking to him, to prove that this was God. So Gideon goes and he gets a goat and cooks it, bakes some unleavened bread, and brings that in the broth to, to Yahweh. Yahweh says, put it on that rock, Pour your broth on it. And then he took the staff that he had in his hand and touched it. And fire came up from the rock and burned it all. And then he disappears. And Gideon realizes that it was Yahweh, that it was God. This is what he says. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of Yahweh, he cried out, Oh, sovereign Yahweh, I'm doomed. I've seen the angel of Yahweh face to face. The Jew knew that he could not look on the face of God and live. And yet God responds to him and says, it's all right. Don't be afraid. You'll not die. And Gideon built an, alt an altar to Yahweh there and named it Yahweh Shalom, which means Yahweh is peace. Then, maybe it's to get Gideon ready or to test, see, to test him to see how, how much he really meant what he said. God tells him to go and tear down his father's False gods, the Asherah poles and the idols that are set up, that all belong to his father. So I want you to tear them all down. Then I want you to build me an altar and use all that wood as fire on that altar and make a sacrifice to the one and true God. So Gideon does that. He does it at night. People got mad at him. They finally found out who it was. And they said, I think it was even Gideon's father. They wanted to kill Gideon, and his father says, oh, let the gods sort it out. But Baal, go ahead and take revenge on him. But nothing happened. And then soon afterward, the armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east formed an alliance against Israel across the Jordan, camping in the valley of Jezreel. Then the spirit of Yahweh took possession of Gideon. He blew a ram's horn as a call to arms, and the men of the clan of Abiezer came to him. He also sent messengers throughout Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, summoning their warriors, and all of them responded. The Spirit of God 
the Holy Spirit did not indwell people in the Old Testament as he does now. Since the day of Pentecost, when a person becomes a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in that person. He indwells that person. In the Old Testament times, he would enter a person when that person needed special guidance or special power to do something. And then later on, he would leave. You see that all through the Old Testament. Now, even though the Holy Spirit entered Gideon at this time, Gideon still wanted more proof. See, Gideon was changed from an oppressed man hiding in a wine press, threshing grain, to a man who still had fear. He just wasn't quite sure. He was not that mighty warrior yet that God called him. Scripture says, Then Gideon said to God, If you're truly going to use me to rescue Israel, as you promised, prove it to me in this way. I will put a wool fleece on the threshing floor tonight. If the fleece is wet with dew in the morning, but the ground is dry, then I will know that you are going to help me rescue Israel as you promised. And that is just what happened. When Gideon got up early the next morning, he squeezed the fleece and wrung out a whole bowl full of water. Yahweh answered Gideon's <coughs> prayer just as Gideon had asked. Dry ground, wet fleece. Should have been a pretty good sign, pretty good answer. But... Then Gideon said to God, Please don't be angry with me, but let me make one more request. Let me use the fleece for one more test. This time, let the fleece remain dry while the ground around it is wet with dew. So that night, God did as Gideon asked. The fleece was dry in the morning, but the ground was covered with dew. I think that when God answers a prayer in the way that you pray it, and he answers it exactly the way you pray it, I think that should be enough of an answer. Whether it was doubt or what, I'm not sure, the Bible doesn't tell us. But Gideon didn't accept just that. He wanted more proof. And God chose to answer him again. Now, how many times do we do that to God? We pray and God gives us an answer, and we're not sure we like that answer, and so we pray again. Turn things around a little bit. Now I know this is a big step for Gideon. From the threshing grain and a wine press to leading an entire nation. Maybe he needed a little more encouragement from God. So anyway, Gideon gets up the next morning. He knows he's supposed to lead this army. He gets up, gathers his army. 22,000 in his army. That's got to be encouraging. But God says differently. He says you have too many. See, God wants to make sure that his people knew that it was him doing the work through them. That they weren't doing it in their own strength. So Gideon does what God tells him. Talks to these 22,000 people and he says, if you're afraid, go home. No problems. Just go on home. 10,000 left. 10,000 is still not a bad army. Especially when God says that he is going to win it for you anyway. 20,000 would have been nicer, but 10,000 is okay. In Judges 7, but Yahweh told Gideon, there are still too many. Bring them down to the spring, and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. When Gideon took his warriors down to the water, Yahweh told him, Divide the men into two groups. In one group put all those who cup water in their hands and lap it with their tongues like dogs. In the other group put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the stream. Only 300 of the men drank from their hands. All the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths in the stream. Why this test? You know, you take time to think it through and, and you can understand. Those who got down on their hands and knees and put their mouth to the water, it's easier to drink that way. You can suck up a whole lot more water quicker. But in that position, you're totally vulnerable. You're not able to see the enemy around you. Your hands are on the ground. You're not holding a weapon. Your face is in the water. You can't see anything. The 300 
knelt down by the water. They reached down with their hand and brought the water up to their mouth so they could see all around them. They held their weapon in their other hand. They were prepared for battle. We need to be prepared for battle at all times. Sometimes convenience is not the best way to go. So from 20,000 to 10,000 to 300, to fight an army made up of Midian, Amalek, and the peoples of the east, they were quite outnumbered as far as they were concerned. But God was in control. Yahweh told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. So Gideon co collected the provisions and ram's horns and of the other warriors and sent them home. But he kept the 300 men with him. There would be no doubt that it was Yahweh who would rescue them and give them this victory. That night Yahweh said, get up. Go down to the Midianite camp because I've given you victory over them. But if you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant, Purim. Listen to what the Midianites are saying, and you will be greatly encouraged. Then you will be eager to attack. Well, this has happened before midnight, and we'll see that a little bit later. But, you know, there's still some doubt in Gideon's mind. You know, he always says, okay, I want you to take your army down and attack them now. But if you're not ready, just you and your servant go down and listen to what's being said. Get still some doubt there. I mean, Joshua, I mean, he had to fight an arm, uh, a war by marching around the wall seven times, but at least he had a full army. I only have 300. I know God is for me, but what if those what ifs cause us a lot of trouble today? So God gave him a little more encouragement. Gideon went down to the camp with his servant. He snuck in into the outskirts and he heard these two men talking. One of them had a dream and shared what the dream said and then he shared what it meant. And basically it was that the Israelites are going to defeat all of us. We have no hope. Gideon and his 300 men did not wait till dawn. He went back to the camp. So when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed and worshipped before Yahweh. Then he returned to the Israelite camp and shouted, Get up! Because Yahweh has given you victory over the Midianite hordes. He divided his men, he divided the 300 men into three groups and gave each man a ram's horn and a clay jar with a torch in it. Then he said to them, Keep your eyes on me. When I come to the edge of the camp, do just as I do. As soon as I and those with me blow the ram's horns, Blow your horns too, all around the entire camp, and shout for Yahweh and for Gideon. It was just after midnight, after the changing of the guard, when Gideon and the 100 men with him reached the edge of the Midianite camp. Suddenly they blew the ram's horns and broke their clay jars. Then all three groups blew their horns and broke their jars. They held the blazing torches in their left hands and their horns in their right hands, and they all shouted, A sword for Yahweh and for Gideon. Each man stood at his position around the camp and watched as all the Midianites rushed around in a panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When the 300 Israelites blew the ram's horns, Yahweh caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. Those who were not killed fled to places as far away as, as Beth Shittah, near Zerah, and to the border of Abel Mahola, near Tabith. The invading armies fought and killed each other. The Israelites didn't even have to raise a hand except to hold up their torch. They made themselves available, but God fought the battle. Then Gideon sent for the warriors of Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh, who joined in chasing the army of Midian. Gideon also sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down to attack the Midianites. Cut them off at the shallow crossings of the Jordan River at Beth Barah. So all the men of Ephraim did as they were told. They captured Oreb and Zeeb, the two Midianite commanders, killing Oreb at the Rock of Oreb and Zeeb at the winepress of Zeeb. They continued to chase the Midianites. Afterward, the Israelites brought the heads of Oreb and Zeeb to Gideon, who was, a, who was by the Jordan River. Gideon was an oppressed man hiding in a wine press. Changed into a mighty warrior. 
who freed his people from their oppression. Do you realize that God wants you to be doing things like that? Gideon is an example for us. God wants us to be fighting wars. Maybe not physical battles, but spiritual battles. The spiritual battle that takes place in your life every day. The spiritual battle that's happening in your family every day. Fight the spiritual battles that our church goes through. All the people that live around you to fight spiritual battles to set them free. God can and will use any of us just to like, like he used Gideon. We may start out as fearful people hiding in a wine press. We may start out doubting God and doubting ourselves. We may ask for signs and reassurances to strengthen our weak faith. But then God will give us a test to see if we will obey him. You may say it with your mouth, but until you do it with your actions, it means nothing. And God will give you the time to put your words into action. God will give you a test to see if you will obey him. Steadily, God will always prepare you for the work he has given you to do. He will always prepare you. He will fill you with his Holy Spirit to enable you to do it. You'll be called to fight upon enemies like false teachings or worldliness or ungodliness and idolatry. In Sunday school class, we've been looking at idolatry and the things that we make into idols. We may not make carved images, but we've got a lot of gods that we make. If you're faithful, God will add you to his list of heroes of the faith. Just remember, he will never call you to do something that he will not equip you to do. He will never call you to do something that he will not equip you to do in whatever way he wants you to do. Take a few moments. Allow God to speak to you. Open your ears and listen. Don't ask him for anything. If you must speak, ask him to speak. And then listen. What is he wanting you to do?